All right. Good evening. How are you? Good. It's good to see you here tonight. I'm glad you're here. Hope you had a good week so far, a good Wednesday. Let me make a, a couple of announcements uh, for you uh, to keep you in the loop of what's going on. Uh, the uh, SALT Ladies Ministry will be meeting Saturday morning here at the church. Uh, they'll have breakfast and also have um, a great Bible study. Uh, it starts at 830 and it ends at 11. So ladies, if you will, remember that. Salt uh, Ladies Ministry, you're more than welcome to invite a friend to come. Uh, I think there's a sign-up sheet out there that also asks, like, are you bringing something? And so if you're going to come, be sure to check that out. It's always a good time of fellowship for the ladies. So uh, remember that. Uh, also, uh, let's see, next, uh, oh, actually, this Sunday. This Sunday at 5 o'clock out at Bringle Lake Park, we're having Bless the Backpacks, okay? Bless the black Backpacks. We're going to have a watermelon supper. Hence, we have a watermelon on display. I need, uh, I think this is 12. I think this is a total of 12. I need these 12 watermelons adopted tonight. They're at the door. I need you to adopt this one. Do what now? Yeah, by different people. Well, I mean, if one person wants to do it, that's fine, but we'll be glad to share it. Uh, but I need you to adopt a watermelon, put it in a cooler, uh, ice it down, and bring it Sunday afternoon, okay, out to Bringle Lake Park. So, uh, again, we have 12 of these. I need 12 foster parents, all right, 12 foster parents for these, okay? And I'm going to move this so I can use my chair. But please remember that. Ice them down and bring them. Uh, Sunday, we'll uh, get together after church. We'll get some uh, uh, big, hefty bags to dispose of those. Uh, and we'll also uh, get some plates. Uh, if you want salt on your watermelon, bring your own salt. All right? I have no problem with it. I like salt on watermelon. But uh, if you want to bring salt, you can. We'll have the plates. Uh, let's see. What are, you know, as uh, far as, you know, drinks, Coca-Colas, whatever you drink, Coca-Cola, water, whatever you want to bring. Uh, just bring that out with you. We're not going to provide the drinks, just the watermelons and, and the plate uh, for you to eat it on. So we're going to do that, but you know, the, the, we're going to enjoy the fellowship, but really the primary purpose is to pray over the school year. Uh, bring your children, grandchildren, uh, come out and join us for this. If you're a teacher or you work in the school system, be sure to come out. Uh, I think there's been some misunderstanding. We're not actually asking you to bring backpacks. I think some people have gotten backpacks and put school supplies in them. Uh, if you've done that, bring them. We'll find a needy student for them, but, you know, that's really not what we were asking for. But I do appreciate your generosity. So, again, that'll be Sunday afternoon at uh, 5 o'clock out at Bringle, and uh, we'll, we'll have a good time then. Now, next Wednesday is the last uh, ice cream of the summer for our Wednesday night Bible study, okay? We've done it in June, July, and now in August. And I heard, I wasn't here, I heard the last time we didn't have a whole lot of homemade ice cream. So I'm going to challenge you to bring uh, uh, some Bluebell, okay? Because we want ice cream here. You know, if two people bring ice cream, that's not very good. So everybody, don't worry about your homemade ice cream. Just go get your favorite flavor of Bluebell out of the freezer and bring it here. We'll have the bowls and the spoons and, and all of that. So uh, just remember that Bluebell, whatever your favorite flavor is, I'm sure there's a diversity of flavors that, that people love. So just remember to bring that next uh, Wednesday night, and that'll be our last one for the summer. It's hard to believe summer is rapidly coming to a, to a close. All right? Yeah, it's going to happen. It's going to happen. So we'll... We'll try to figure out something maybe later in the fall. We could have a hot chocolate night or something. We'll look forward to that, right? That'll be good. Okay. Well, good. Well, let's have a, a word of prayer, and we'll get into our uh, study tonight. Father, thank you for the opportunity to be here tonight. Thank you for the revelation of your word. Uh, thank you for how it reveals to us who Christ our Savior is. And I pray tonight as we study that we'll get a clearer understanding of who he is. And it's in the name of Jesus we pray, amen. Now tonight, before we get over to uh, Colossians chapter 1, I want to kind of start over here in the book of Hebrews uh, a second. Hebrews chapter uh, 12, we'll begin looking uh, in verse 25, all right? Hebrews chapter 12, beginning in verse 25. As the, as the letter to the Hebrews comes to a conclusion... 
uh, you really have a, a, a real powerful warning that is here. It's not the first warning. The writer of Hebrews throughout the letter has warned the readers uh, to, to be very careful of the, the choices that, that, they, that they make. Uh, I know we know who the Hebrews letter is written to in the sense that it's written to, to Jewish people or to, to the Hebrews. But, but specifically, what group of people is the, the writer challenging here? He, he's, he's challenging primarily not just, you know, the average Jewish reader, but he's really challenging Jewish leadership. People who have been prone to uh, hear the gospel and to consider the gospel, and uh, they're, they're, they're beginning to turn away from what they've heard. And the, 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 the danger is, is that they're going to go back to Judaism. What is the problem with rejecting the gospel and going back to Judaism? That, I know that doesn't make sense to us because we're Gentiles. And so, you know, most of us didn't come from, you know, false religion. Uh, most of us just came from, you know, just being an unbeliever, right? But, but why in the first century was this such an issue what what was the problem for these people saying you know i've heard this but i just don't believe it and to go back to judaism what what is the danger of that well they didn't want to leave their comfort zone what what's the impact eternally they're lost right and and, and it's it's like this if you and i you know we're going to plan a trip let's say we're going to go to destin okay we're going to go to Destin, and, and we're going to go out to the, uh, to the bus station, all right, over there at Greyhound. We're going to pick up a bus, and we're going to ride a bus uh, over to Destin. Uh, and uh, there's only one more bus that's going to go to Destin. They're going to, shut, they're going to shut it down. No more Greyhound. No more buses are coming. And you and I decide we're not going to take that last bus. What's the problem? You don't get to go. That's the problem of going back to Judaism. Judaism was about a coming Messiah, that the Messiah would come and that he would introduce his kingdom to the world. Well, if they reject Jesus of Nazareth, which is what they're doing, if they reject Jesus of Nazareth, there's not another bus coming. Everything in, the, everything in Judaism, everything in the Old Testament were shadows pointing to the time when the Messiah would come. Well, by the time you get to 68 A.D., which is when this letter is written, you've got the fact that he's come. He's already been here. He's already died. He's already been buried. He's already been, you know, risen from the dead. And he is a seat, uh, seated in heavenly places after the ascension. When he comes back, he's not coming back to save you. He's coming back to judge you. So if you miss this bus, you've missed the bus. And that's the warning that the book of Hebrews is about. You don't want to misunderstand Christ Jesus, Jesus of Nazareth, and the gospel. And you've heard it. You've even been convicted by the Spirit about it. But you're saying no to that. If you say no to him, what? What is, what is the most misunderstood passage in Hebrews? In Hebrews, Go with me over to Hebrews chapter 6. Absolutely the most butchered, misapplied, misinterpreted scripture in the book of Hebrews. Verse 1 of chapter 6, therefore, leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ, let us go on to perfection, let's go on to maturity, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God and of the doctrine of baptisms. Let's pause there a second. What's he mean, the doctrine of baptisms? How many baptisms are there? Then why does he say baptisms? Baptisms. 
under the new covenant, there's only one baptism. Paul says that in Ephesians chapter 4, for there is one Lord, one faith, one baptism. The, the, the baptisms in the Old Testament, there were multiple baptisms. There, there, there was all kinds of purification with water. Ba baptism wasn't a new thing when John the Baptist came on the scene. There's all kinds of baptisms. You know, you do realize that on the, uh, the uh, Day of Atonement that the high priest had to wash before he went into the Holy of Holies with water. You had the laver which was full of water. Baptisms, water in religion has been around for a very, very long time. And so he says, we don't want to lay again the doctrine of what? Repentance, of faith, of baptisms. We don't want to go back to that. Why? They're shadows. Going back to that means nothing now. If if you go back to the Old Testament, if you begin to practice the Old Covenant, you're just going through motions. It means nothing. God's not looking at it. He's not approving it. He's not accepting. Matter of fact, to be frankly honest, it's an offense to him. It offends him. Then he goes on to say here uh, of the laying on of hands. Well, there were multiple laying on of hands for different purposes in the Old Testament. Uh, uh, of the resurrection of the dead. You do realize that the Old Testament preaches about the resurrection of the dead. Resurrection is not a New Testament doctrine. There's more clarity given to it in the New Covenant. But resurrection is taught in the Old Testament. Right? I mean, what did Job say? Job's the first book of the Bible. Chronologically, in order, Job is the first written book of the Bible, and Job says that I know that my Redeemer liveth, and in the last day, what? He will raise me up. That's pretty early. You don't get any earlier, <laughs> right? Uh, end of eternal judgment. Well, you can go back to Enoch for that. Enoch preaches judgment. How do I know that? Well, Jude says that God revealed to him about what? The coming of judgment at, at, at the end of time. And he says, and, and this we will do if God permits. And then he says in verse 4, For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened, have tasted the heavenly gift, have become partakers of the Holy Spirit, have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come, if they fall away to renew them again to repentance, since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put him to an open shame. What's he referring to there? Now, remember the context. I'm going to ask you again, what's the context? Who's he writing to? What's his concern? And not even, not necessarily believers. People who've heard the gospel. That they're on the fence. Yeah, and, 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 if you, and if you do what? If you have been exposed and you turn away, he's not coming back to be crucified again. This is it. This, this is what, this is it. This is it. Now, your context makes sense, too, when you get into Hebrews chapter 9, when it says what? For it is appointed unto man once to die, and after this the judgment. What's the next verse say? Go over to chapter 9, verse uh, 28. We oftentimes just quote verse uh, 27, but you need, to, you need to stay with verse uh, 28 as well. It says, and it is appointed unto men to die once, but after this the judgment. Then you have this little word there. So, because it is appointed unto man once to die, and there is judgment. So, well, so what? So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly await for him, he will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. What you do with Jesus of Nazareth is critically important. 
And what you do with him is based upon the revelation that God gives about him and his work, not what you want it to be. What I think about Jesus doesn't matter. What, what I think about the work of Jesus doesn't matter. What God reveals about him is what matters. And we have to understand that in the Christian faith, what we do with Jesus is absolutely unique from the rest of the world. The Buddhist does not believe what the Bible reveals about Jesus. Those in Islam do not receive the revelation of who Jesus is. Hindus. I've just, I've just given you billions of people. Hello? Billions out of seven and a half billion people on the planet. There are billions of people who reject the revelation of who Jesus is. Can I tell you another group? Judaism. The Jews. Do not embrace the revelation of who Jesus is. That is tragic. And there are those within Christendom who do not receive the revelation of who Jesus is and what God has revealed his work was. They are lost. Right. Right. Well, in, in, the, in Judaism, if you embrace Jesus as your Messiah, they have a funeral for you. Not literally, but figuratively, and you're as good as what? Dead. That probably happens in some families that are not Christian. They reject their own family members. The, the warning is so severe that at the end of this letter, when you get into chapter 12, verse 25, listen to these words. And, and I want you to pick up on the urgency and the sobriety in which the writer pens these words. See that you do not refuse him who speaks. For if they did not escape who refused him, who spoke on earth, much more shall we not escape if we turn away from him who speaks from heaven. People rejected Jesus and his ministry when he was in their face on the earth. As serious of a crime as that is, now that he has been resurrected and is Lord of all and is seated in heavenly places, he is speaking from heaven. Think about the sobriety of the judgment when he speaks from heaven and we reject him. He says here, whose voice then shook the earth and now he has promised saying, yet once more I shake, not only the earth but also heaven. Now this, yet once more, indicates the removal of those things that are being shaken as of the things that are made, that the things which cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God accept acceptably with reverence and godly fear, for our God is a consuming fire. If we lack anything in the modern church, in my opinion, is the appropriate reverence for God. We, we, we have, and you've heard me mention this before and I won't belabor it, we, we have adopted this God is my buddy mentality. Mm -hmm. right 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 well and, and it's a powerful sermon because it puts everything in the proper perspective you know and we we need to be reminded often of the proper perspective and, and it's hard for us to do because we just don't want to in our flesh embrace the truth 
The fact is that everybody in this room, everybody in the world for that matter, deserves to die and go to hell. That's the fact. Every one of us. That's what we deserve by nature. And, and, and we must approach God reverently. And even though I have come to salvation and forgiveness of my sins, even though I have been redeemed and now I'm his child, that doesn't mean I should be at all flippant about my relationship with God. And, and you have such a stark warning here. So with, with that in mind, going back to over to Colossians, what we have revealed for us about the person and the work of Jesus in this passage should cause us to, to be reverent and awestruck and full of worship because we need to see Jesus as who he is. The ancient world in which Paul is writing to these Colossian believers and the pressure that they're under, they, they lived in a world that had a, a, a philosophy of dualism. And it was... That philosophy of dualism is that everything spiritual is good and everything material is evil. And so, if that being the case, then what are you going to do with Jesus? Because the gospel teaches that God, that, that God came in the person of Jesus and that Jesus was what? <clears throat> God in the flesh. Well, these people didn't believe that. <clears throat> they, they were influenced by the philosophy of, of dualism. And so if Jesus was God, he never would be in a human body. But if Jesus doesn't come in a human body, what does that do to your hope of salvation? There's not any hope. I mean, if Jesus could have sent an angel, he would have sent an angel. But he came himself in the person of, of his son, Jesus, and so in verse 15, and we've, we've looked at this, let me remind us as we make our way rapidly through the remainder of this section, speaking of Jesus, he says that he is the image of the visible God or the invisible God. You can't see God. God's not visible to human eyes. But God became visible to human eyes when Jesus was born into the world. That's important for us to understand. Because he is God. He's not a God. He is the God. What, what this first century believed is that there was God, and like ripples on a water, the Spirit of God uh, had uh, emanations, if you will. And he, he, his Spirit would emanate certain beings, and those beings initially were good, but... But as these emanations began to develop more and more and as they got away from the goodness of God, then some became evil. And they believed that it was one of these emanations that created everything material. Because there's no way that a good God, by essence, there's no way that a good God could create something evil. And so his point here in, in writing in this first century is Jesus is the image. He's the visible manifestation of the invisible God, and he is the firstborn over all creation. When we, we talked about this last week, when we talk about firstborn, we're talking about not a biological birth. And, and God forbid that we're suggesting that Jesus is the first of all creation, that he was created. And there are those who teach that. Your Jehovah's Witness, your Mormons, other religious sects teach that, <clears throat> that Jesus was what? A created being. But he's far more than that. And, and it says here that he is the firstborn. In rank, he is over all creation. It, for example, uh, if I say, let's see. Did anybody coach their kids in peewee anything? All right, Chris. All right. If I tell you that, that Chris Jackson is a 10-year-old girl's softball coach, I'm telling you that he is what? He's over 
the 10-year-old girls softball team. I'm not telling you that he is a 10-year-old girl who plays softball. And, and to interpret this passage when it says that he is the firstborn over creation and to say, well, see there, it says that Jesus is the first of all creation is to misinterpret the passage. He is not one of the creation. He is over in rank over all creation. And if you keep reading, it says, for by him. For by him all things were created. Rank. Jesus is above all creation because all creation is secondary to him. He's not a part of it. He's above it. It would not exist without him. Nothing would exist without him. Jesus. Jesus created everything outside of the Godhead because the Godhead wasn't created. It predated everything. For by him all things, all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth Visible and invisible. Things you can see, things you can't see. Tonight when you go out, if the weather is appropriate and you look up, you're going to see the moon. How did the moon get there? It was created by Jesus. When you look out and you see stars, they were created by Jesus. The atoms, A-T-O-M-S, the atoms that make up that chair were created by Jesus. You wouldn't have that chair if Jesus had not created the materials that were necessary to make that chair. Understand this. Jesus created everything out of nothing. God didn't, Jesus didn't use material outside of man, right? Outside, basically, of what he did on the sixth day, he created everything out of, out of, out of nothing, right? But on the sixth day, he formed what? Man, not just man, what else did he form? Deer, elephant, giraffes. If you read the book of Genesis, he formed all of that. He took material that was already there, and what did he do? He made them. He fashioned them. Right? But before there was the stuff, the material, he had to create that. Creation is a mind-boggling concept. That should cause us in humility to worship such a powerful being who out of nothing, you and I, we talk about that. Well, you know, we, we, we use that term flippantly in our culture. You know, well, they're the creator of the Tesla or they're the creator of the IBM or they're the creator. No, we're not. We're not creators. All we do is just move material around. We rearrange material. That's all we do. We don't create anything. We create nothing. Because to create something means it comes out of nothing. And that's exactly what Jesus did. And, and what he's saying here, confronting the culture that the Colossians are struggling with is, you say of dualism, there is good and there is evil, and if it's material, it's evil. He says, that is absolutely not true. A good God created things that are material. And it was Jesus who is in a material body. I mean, th and think about that for a second. Jesus condescended to be in a body. And he will forever be in a body. Think about it. God in a body. He was in a body when he was born. He was in a body when he died. 
He was in a body when he was buried. He was in a body when he is resurrected. He is in a body today. When he comes back, he's going to be in a body. When he comes and sets up his kingdom, he's going to be in a body. And when the ages of eternity roll on and on and on, Jesus will forever be in a body. Think about God doing that, condescending to do that. What a, what a mysterious, all-inspiring truth. It's crazy. It's just, it's hard to fathom. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and what? Jesus created everything for what? himself everything exists for him verse 17 he is before all things that shouldn't surprise us if he's God God has always existed no beginning. He's eternal. Pause a second and reflect on this. God has eternal life. God has eternal life. He is before all things, and in him all things what? Consist. What does that mean? All things consist. All things are held together by Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. That's what it means. It's all stuck together by him. All things are held together by him. That chair you're sitting on is being held together by Jesus. The clothes you're wearing, thank God, are being held together by Jesus. You are being held together by Jesus. All of the universe, the, the supernovas, the sun, the earth, the seas, the fish, the galaxies, light years away, are all being held together by Jesus, and it does not exhaust him at all. Now, let's pause a second and put a parenthetical thought here. What are you worried about? What about in your life that you think has fallen apart that Jesus has no control over? If he's able to hold the supernovas together, do you think that he can hold your stuff together? Absolutely. Absolutely. And then he goes on to say what? And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn. There's that term again, the firstborn from the dead. That in all things he might have the preeminence. When you go back to uh, verse, uh, the end of verse uh, 16, when it says all things were created through him and for him, tie the end of verse 18 together. All things were created through him and for him in order that all things, that in all things he may have the preeminence. Sounds somewhat egotistical, doesn't it? Almost sounds ego-driven that everything was made for him. But it was. Everything was made for him. Not even that. Not even that. It hadn't got anything to do with us. Now, do we get to enjoy it? Sure, he shares it. But it has nothing to do with us. That, that, that is the point that I'm trying to communicate here. We are worshipers. One second. We are worshipers. It's not about us. That's the problem with modern-day Christianity. We think it's about us. It's not about us. My salvation is not about me. My salvation is for the glory of God. That's why our worship is weak and powerless. 
Because we come to church and think it's about us. E even the genre of music oftentimes that we sing is very egocentric. It's about us. About how God can bless me and about how God can comfort me and how God gives me this and God gives me that. It's not about us. Christ. It's about Christ. He is the exalted one. He is the preeminent one. And anything that I may receive as a result of that is purely by grace. Because I deserve nothing. I don't even deserve to be here. I don't deserve to have breath in my lungs. I don't, I don't deserve to even exist. What would happen in our worship if Christ truly became exalted? We, we have so watered down the gospel that we think it's about us. The plans and the purposes of God are not about us. They are about what? The exaltation of his son. Why is that? Paul says in Philippians chapter 2 that what? That God has highly exalted him. That one day every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is what? Lord to the glory of the Father. 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 Not about me. It's all about Jesus. He is the Lord. He's the highly exalted one. All things exist so that he might have what? The supremacy. And the worship. Creation has fallen. He is the preeminent one above creation and it has fallen and if the story ended there it would be nothing but tragedy. That's why he talks about what he talks about next. Verse 18, my translation says and. What does your say? And. Doesn't end there. There's not a period that says that he created all things, all things exist for him and, and, and through him, and he is the head over all things, uh, and that he holds all things together. That's not where it ends. It doesn't end with that. It continues with what? And. And he is the head of the body. The head. The head. What is the most important part of your body or your existence? Your physical body, what is it? It's your head. Why, why, is, why is the head so important to the body? Yeah, it directs what? It, it, it directs, the, it, it has voluntary and involuntary. There, there's things that happen that you don't have to think about. Aren't you glad? I mean, I'm glad that simultaneously I don't have to tell my eyes to look and my heart to beat. That I don't have to tell my heart to beat and my lungs to pump air. But where does all that come from? The head. The head. And the head gives me what? The ability to see and hear and smell and taste. Right? Receiving information and processing that information. And, and again, voluntarily and involuntary. What? Get, sending every signal that, that needs to happen throughout the, the entire body. Here we are. We are in creation that is lost. We're in cre creation that is under condemnation. But what did Jesus do? Jesus, who is the creator of all of this, steps into time and space in a body to do what? Well, we're going to jump and then come back up. Verse 20, and by him, Jesus, to reconcile all things to himself by him, whether things on, or, or on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. The, 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 purpose, uh, the, the purpose of Jesus coming was reconciliation. Because the creator had been separated from his creation because of man's fall. And he 
comes in a body. And, and, and again, going to verse 19, for it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell. Not part of the fullness, not most of the fullness, all of the fullness. All the fullness of what? Of God. Everything that the Father is, the Son is. And in a human body, all of the fullness of God dwelled in him. God was here. God was on the planet that he created. God, God walked on the dirt. He smelt the flowers. He saw the, the, the moon at night and he felt the warmth of the sun that he had spoken into existence on his skin. God! God! God felt the sun and the wind and the taste of cold water on his tongue. And he saw the, the pretty flowers and he heard the birds sing. The, all of that that he set into motion. God! Not my buddy. God. Awesome. Indescribable. Invisible. Far above anything that I can imagine. Uh, uh, a, a, and I know we don't like to talk about this because we all worry about our self-esteem. I am a what? I am a wretched worm. You say, you shouldn't talk about yourself that way. That's who I am apart from what? Redemption. You can't have good news till you face the bad news. We used to sing that. Alas, and did my Savior bleed, and did my Sovereign die? Would He devote that sacred head for such a worm as I? Read it now. Read it now. It, it went from worm to sinner to person. That's a beautiful hymn. And whoever edits that ought to be kicked in the behind. That he would redeem such a person as I? No, 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 no. Such a sinner as I? No, no, no. Worm? Yeah. When I truly understand who I am and what I deserve? Absolutely. But see, that's what makes grace so amazing grace. If I meet God halfway, it ain't too amazing. If I meet him all the way, it's not amazing. But if he condescends to meet me where I'm at, weak and ungodly and a sinner under condemnation and in darkness and takes me by the hand and reconciles me to himself, that is amazing grace. That's why the world doesn't listen to us. Because they don't understand who they are. And when we water it down, we're, we're not doing our duty. He has what? He has reconciled all things, what? To himself. Verse 20, and by him, to reconcile all things to himself. By him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. Having made peace. Romans chapter 5. While we were yet sinners... Christ died for us. You know, if you want to know why Billy Graham had such an impactful ministry for all of those years, he preached the gospel. He, he was unashamed to announce that we are all sinners separated from God and that Christ is the only solution to that issue. And now we get up and we hear people mamby-pamby around because we're worried about everybody's self-esteem. I would much rather be confronted with the truth and receive Christ and go into eternity and spend eternity with God than to live for 70 years with a good self-esteem and die and go to hell. And preachers who play that game will be held responsible for that. We are, we are watchmen. What's a watchman? Yeah, it's an ancient term. They're, these were these were what centuries. They were they were in towers, or they walked around the gates, or they walked around the wall. And, and their job in the middle of the night, when an invading army to, was coming, their job was to do what? To arouse people that danger is here.
What would happen to a man if he slept? What would happen to a man if he didn't announce danger was coming? Blood was on his hands. The church has got to reawaken to our calling. Not just me as a pastor, not just ordained ministers, but as believers, we are all called to do what? To be watchmen. And you say, yeah, but what if they don't wake up? That's on them. What, what, what if Paul Revere rides around and says, the British are coming and the British are coming, and everybody says, I know, but I'm tired, I'll just stay in the bed. That's on them, not him. Back to verse 18, he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. That's good news. Jesus isn't just the firstborn from the dead for himself. He is the firstborn from the dead for millions and millions and millions of believers. It's, it, 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 it doesn't do me any good if Jesus was resurrected just for himself. But he wasn't just resurrected from himself. He's the firstborn of what? Paul says in another place, the first fruits of resurrection. The resurrection of Jesus secures my resurrection. And, and, and resurrection both spiritually and physically. Because we have been raised from the dead already. Notice what he says here in chapter 3. He says, if ye then were raised with Christ, were raised, were raised. You, you already have been raised with Christ spiritually. But there's also what a resurrection that's coming. Now, one of the things too I'll add at this point right here is, I'm thankful for the blessed hope. What is the blessed hope? Not just that, but that I may live to see his return and not die. But if I do, I'm still going to be a participant on that day. If I die on the way home and you bury me, and I've told you this before, cry a lot. I mean, make it big. I mean, I don't want to go without, you know, people really being sad. I want you to be really, really sad. I want you to struggle for months, all right? Maybe years. It's probably not going to happen. That's why I paid people. There are people that have already been contracted out. Right, paid mourners, all right? But, but seriously, what is sown in corruption will be raised in incorruption. What has been sown in mortality will be raised to immortality. Why? Because it happened to Jesus. And there's a promise that's given to us of that. And, and he is the firstborn of that. He's the preeminent one from the dead. Let me wrap up here with a, a couple of things as we, we look at this. Verse 20, again, it says, whether things on earth or things in heaven, he has reconciled these things, having made peace through the blood of his cross. There's no other way to have peace with God. Your religion will not bring you peace with God. Your water baptism it didn't say having made peace through the water of a baptistry or communion or any sacrament or any good work or any effort or any trying hard. You have been reconciled. You have got, you have peace with God. By the way, to the point that he shared his life with you. You know, we, we talked about that briefly, that God has eternal life. You have eternal life because God's given you what? His life. It's not conditional life. 
It's eternal life. And it says here that, 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 that we have peace. This, this, Robert, kind of what we were talking about earlier, this addresses that. Because not only do I have peace with God, Meditate on that. I just, I just said something wonderful. There is no hostility between you and God. There's none. His wrath has been satisfied toward you. That's not true of everybody. The wrath of God is going to fall on some people one day. Rightfully so. Because they've done what? They didn't listen to him who speaks. God is just. Makes us uncomfortable because we're milk toast. We're, we're milk toast people today. We don't have the stomach for truth today. But the truth of the matter is God is just in sending people to hell. I don't know how we, we dance around it. Well, God didn't send anybody to hell. Uh, yeah, absolutely, he does. You reject his son. Don't, don't have milk toast for a backbone. That's why the gospel is an imperative. That's why we must share the gospel. I have peace with God through the cross, but I also have peace on a level that we don't often think about. Uh, go over here to chapter 2. I don't want to get ahead of myself, but I have to. Because everything, and I, and I want you to get this, everything, i got eight minutes, everything that Paul is saying about Jesus in verses 15 through 20 is going to impact the rest of the book. This is the basis by which everything else unfolds. Because if Jesus isn't who he claimed to be, if his work is not sufficient, you can tear out this page and this page and this page and this page. As a matter of fact, take this book and throw it in the fire. Because if these verses are not true, the whole thing's a lie. Jesus is a fraud. Christianity's a fraud. None of it. If that's not true, on top of that, we have no hope. Not only do I have peace with God, but there's also peace in this respect. Colossians chapter 2, verse 13. And you being dead in your trespasses. Not on event. Not in ICU, not at the doctor's office, not with the flu, but you being dead, dead, dead in trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh. Now, see, now he's kind of hitting the Judaizers. In these verses, he's been hitting these Gnostic mystics who said that Jesus was a phantom. In their commentaries, we've, we have these to read from the first century and even later, that the Gnostics believed that Jesus was ghost-like, that he was a phantom, and that when he walked, he didn't leave a footprint. He's, he's dealt with the foolishness of the Gnostics. Over here now, when he says the uncircumcision of your flesh, he's attacking the Judaizers because the Judaizer says that in order to be made right with God, you have to be physically circumcised. The issue is not with the, the physical circumcision. It's what? The uncircumcision of your flesh. Not, not in the sense of your body, but what? Your nature. Uh, and I want to be very careful here, but, but it, it, it's important to make the point. W why do we physically circumcise children today? It's a health issue. It's sanitary. It's a sanitary issue. Okay? Um, again, I'm wanting to be appropriate because we're in, we're in mixed company, and I, I will be appropriate, but the Bible teaches it, and so we'll address it in modesty. 
But if, if you know anything about not being circumcised, gentlemen, and if you're not circumcised, my father was not circumcised. He lived all of his life and was never circumcised. And, and I can remember, and again, I know this is, this is delicate, and so I want to be modest, but as a little boy, I might be in the bathroom, in the bathtub. As a little boy, my father would come in and use the restroom, and, and there was a, a significant difference in appearance. And I was curious. Didn't get a lot of answers, but was curious. Well, over time, I began to understand that. But, but what was necessary for my father to maintain his hygiene required much more than I having been circumcised. Because if you don't take care of that, what happens? You can have infections. And what happens if you're married and you, have a, uh, you make love to your wife? What are you doing? You're passing it on. It, it, it is really unsanitary. Not only is it a matter of being unsanitary, and, and I know that this, 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 this it, it makes the point, and, and we have to face it for what it is. Not only is it unsanitary, but it stinks. It's, it's unacceptable. The reason I tell you that is, is because you and I, when we were without Christ, we were uncircumcised in our flesh. Which means what? Before God, we stunk. And so God had to what? When we receive Christ as our Savior, we like the beauty of the, well, we clean it up for our culture. We like the beauty of the cross. You know, you see pictures of Jesus on the cross. You got a little blood here and a little blood here and got a few little trickles here and all that. Hardly, hardly the case. But, but we, we clean it up. We also clean up this whole concept of circumcision. The fact of the matter is, it, it, un, un, people who do not have the proper hygiene in uh, being uncircumcised, not only does it pass on disease, but it, it has a wretched stench that is absolutely unpleasant. That's where we are before God until God circumcises our heart. Alas, and did my Savior bleed? And would my sovereign die? Would he devote that sacred head for such a worm as I? The gospel is absolutely beautiful. It, it, it allows me to have peace with God, but, but not only that, again... It says that in uh, and, and, and you, verse 13, having been dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together. He has made alive together with him, having forgiven you. How many? You can't have a fully circumcised heart if he doesn't do that. This is, this is not a license to go out and do whatever we want to do. This, this isn't a stamp of approval that now that all my sins are forgiven, I can go and behave the way that I want to behave. God forbid. He has made us alive together with him. How's he done that? He gave me his life. And God's life is eternal life. So he's given me eternal life. Not conditional life. Not hope so life. Not maybe life. He's given me his life. He, eternal life. He has what? Having forgiven you. Having forgiven. That's an aorist tense verb. The closest we have in our language is past tense. Having forgiven. Past tense. And here's some mystery and uh, just the nature of who God is. You were forgiven at the cross. You received it the day you believed and received. Might I also add that that work accomplished in time and space 
had already been accomplished in eternity past. He is the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. Wow. Wow. Having forgiven you all trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us. What's he talking about? All, all the law, all the regulations. Whenever a, a man was crucified, you know this from the reading of the Gospels. Whenever a man was crucified in the Roman government, when you were crucified and hung on a cross, it wasn't done in private. It was done in a major high traffic area, wherever it was, and people passed by there and would see you, and they would look up, and they could see a, a sign above your head. What did the sign say? What crimes you broke? So you better not break that law. You better not break that law because this is the consequence of breaking that law. Jesus on the cross took what? The handwriting of ordinances that was against us. Every law that we've ever broken, are breaking, or will break on the cross, 29 AD, not only for me, but for you, and for you, and for you, and for you. He took there and what did he do? It was nailed to the cross. And what did God say? I am putting the guilt of all of these broken laws on him. He'll pay for them. He'll pay for them. When it says that was contrary to us, what that means is what we deserved has now been laid to somebody else. By a lamb without blemish who had no sin. Why? He's the creator. He is the visible God. The fullness of God dwelt in him bodily. And he came bodily so he could die in our place. And then you want to bring your baptism? You want to bring your communion wafer? You want to bring your good works? Can you imagine how offensive that is? That, that, that God in a bod shows up and that's insufficient? Verse continues, and he has taken it out of the way. I want you to add something in your notes because this is the tense of the verb. And he has taken it out of the way once and for all. Go back to Hebrews. Why are you going to reject what he's done? He's done this once and for all. He's not doing it again. It's not necessary. It's not the fact that he satisfied your religious thinking. It's that he satisfied the judgment of God. He has done this, what, once and for all. That's why, that's why Jesus is your high priest after the order of Melchizedek, not after the order of Aaron. But most Christians treat the priesthood of Jesus like it's the priesthood of Aaron. How do I know that? Because they don't know that their sins are resolved. They keep coming to Jesus as if he's a priest after the order of Aaron. What did the priesthood of Aaron deal with? Atonement for sin. Had to bring a sacrifice. When? Daily. There were sacrifices being made whether you showed up or not. There were millions and millions and millions and millions of animals that were sacrificed. Why? They were symbolic. They were a shadow of something to come. But that's why it says that Jesus has the what? The priesthood of Melchizedek. Why? Because sin's dealt with. If Jesus is still after Aaron, we're in trouble. But he's not. He's after Melchizedek. What's the difference? One atones for sin. One offers blessing. 
Jesus isn't up in heaven praying about your sin. Chew on that. Get that settled once and for all. Because if you don't, you can't do what the next verse says. For we have a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, therefore, let us come boldly. If you're worried about sin, you're not bold if you, if you have a reverence for God. If you don't think sin's dealt with, you better not march in that throne room. It's the height, it, it, ladies and gentlemen, is the height of arrogance to not attribute to the work of Christ what he has accomplished and to think that your good works or your behavior or your religious spirit is going to somehow appease. He has once and for all dealt with that And he has taken it out of the way once and for all, having nailed it to the cross. And not only that, here, here's where I want to talk about it. You and I have peace with God because of that. Understand this. God sees you in Christ. If you're a child of God, God sees you in Christ. Therefore, you have peace with God. If you're not in Christ, I don't care how much good you do, you are uncircumcised and you stink. And by the way, self-righteousness reeks. To the conversation we had, it reeks in the nostrils of God. It is offensive to God. But here's some even better news. Not only peace with God, but notice this. I love this. And he has taken it out of the way. Everything that's on that cross, everything that's listed against me, he took my place. <laughs> I owed a debt I could not pay. He paid a debt he did not owe. And right there on that cross, every sin, every one, everything, Everything and the uncircumcision of my flesh he took upon himself and God poured out his wrath on his son once and for all and he took those things away and not only did he do that having disarmed principalities and powers he made a public spectacle of them triumphing over them in it. When the devil accuses you he has no power. When other people accuse you, it doesn't have to stick. If other people accuse you about your past and it sticks, it's because you let it. And here's the thing, and you don't have to argue with them about it. Agree with them. Well, I heard you did. Yep. Yep. That was bad. Yep. Well, that violated God's law. Yep. Now, do I say that in arrogance? Nope. I do it so that Christ gets the preeminence. Should we sin that grace may abound? God forbid. But the accusations against you have been disarmed. They have no power. It goes back to the fact that has it ever occurred to you that nothing has ever occurred to God? God's not looking when Satan accuses you and goes, man, would somebody up here give me an update? What is my response to this? I, I, I told you I'll let you go. I, I, give me one more. Give me one more. Give me one more. Back to Hebrews chapter 12. Are you ready? Verse 18. 
For you have not come to the mountain that may be touched and burned with fire and to blackness and darkness and tempest and the sound of a trumpet and the voice of words so that those who heard it begged that the word should not be spoken to them anymore for they could not endure what was commanded. And if so much as a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned or shot with an arrow. And so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I am trim exceedingly afraid and trembling. What's he talking about there? You, you don't come to worship God at Mount Sinai. You don't want to come worship God at Mount Sinai. That's what he's referring to here, Mount Sinai. Do, do you know that God in his righteousness and holiness told the people three days before they even approached the mountain that they had to clean themselves. They had to wash their clothes. They had to wash their body. They had to wash everything they owned before he would even let them get close to that mountain. He even said, if you... When I appear, when I come down on the mountain, and you're going to know when I do, how are you going to know? Right here. For you have not come to the mountain that may be touched uh, and burned with fire. It would, our God is a consuming fire. Burned with fire to blackness and darkness to what? A storm. When they, when, they, when they got all of the things that they needed to do to get close to the mountain, they got close to the mountain, God descended on the mountain. And when he did, it shook everything up. Fire, darkness, storm. The presence of God was there. The people knew it. And God gave them a warning. Don't touch this mountain. You touch this mountain... And you will die. Alas, and did my Savior bleed. Where, where would I be, Roy, if God in Abad didn't show up? I can't get close to him. If I even touch the mountain, I'll die. And, and what about this? And if so much as a beast touches the mountain, stone it. Anything that comes near me in my holiness has to die. Now, do we have a proper reverence for God? Maybe if we begin there, instead of marching in church on Sunday all casual, distracted by foolishness, Thinking the teaching's too long and the music's too loud. Distracted by what sister so-and-so is wearing and what brother so-and-so smells like. Instead of realizing that what? Apart from Christ, we can't approach. And he says, but you've not come to that mountain. If you've received Christ, you don't go to that mountain. By the way, that's the only mountain you can go to if you don't go to Christ. And I can tell you the outcome, it's death. Oh, but I'm trying hard, it's death. Oh, but, but I'm religious, it's death. Oh, but I got some good works, it's death. But we don't come to that mountain. Now where does the worship happen? But you, in contrast to that, but you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and the church of the firstborn. <laughs> there we go again, the firstborn. To the church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven, to God the judge of all men, to the spirits of just men made perfect, to Jesus the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel. I have no idea to how many people I'm teaching the Word of God to tonight. I have no idea how big the crowd is. You say, well, that's not too hard. It shouldn't take you long to count here. No, 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 no. You see, when you walked in here, 
at 6.30, when we kicked this thing off, heaven opened. Heaven opened. Do you you realize that when you come into worship as believers on a Sunday, you come in, we set aside Sunday morning at 10.30, we corporately set aside, what, 6.30 on Wednesday? When you walked in here, heaven opened up. Who's here? Jesus. Who's here? God, the judge of all. Who? An innumerable number of angels are right here. Of the spirits of dead believers who have gone on before us. They're all here in this moment. Heaven fell in this place. Is your spirit sensitive to it? This is a holy place. Not because we called it a church. It's a holy place because God's people met. This is is some of the redeemed of all of the ages that Jesus died for. And he showed up here. And if God would just help us open our eyes that we could see. What a blessed privilege it is to be here with one another. And with saints who have gone before. And what? The resurrected Lord Jesus Christ. And the Father, his Son, who created all things. And who is the firstborn of resurrection. And an innumerable number of angels. The fact that we're here tonight is not minimized by the fact that there's less than a hundred of us. God meets with us here as surely as he meets with the people at First Baptist Church. Or the First Baptist Church of Atlanta. Or the First Baptist Church at Dallas. On Sunday morning in some of the, in the churches in America, there are 10,000, 20,000, 30,000 people that show up. And people think, what? Heaven has showed up. Sunday morning at Oasis Community Church, heaven shows up. You say, yeah, but you're in a mall. It doesn't make any difference. It doesn't even make any difference. Why? Because this is passing away. It doesn't matter anyway. And back to what we were talking about before. Well, I know what you did. That don't matter either. It's been nailed at the cross. And his blood speaks greater things than Abel. This is where I'm going to wrap it up. People have all kinds of misunderstandings about Cain and Abel. God took Abel's and didn't take Cain's. The question is, well, why did he take Abel's and he didn't take Cain's? And people say, well, it was the blood. It wasn't the fruit of the field. Got to be careful there because in the Old Testament law, didn't God take offerings of the fruit of the field? They were to bring grains. So that's not the issue. Now, I'm not saying that blood's not important. It absolutely is. But that wasn't the basis of rejection. The basis of rejection, one was brought in faith to what God spoke, and one was what? Brought in the efforts of man. So what is acceptable worship? You remember how we started tonight? See that you do not refuse him who speaks. We don't come into worship on Wednesday night. And by the way, just because we don't sing a song doesn't mean we're not worshiping. And just because you sing a song doesn't mean you're worshiping. What what is worship? When we hear him speak and in faith we receive and obey. Most of that worship happens outside of here. You only got a few hours in here. It's important. But most of your worship takes place outside the door. Because you hear him speak into your life. And what do you do? You trust and obey. And it speaks better things. The blood of Jesus speaks better things than the things of Abel. Why? Because Jesus said at the end of his ministry, right before they betrayed him and crucified him, he said, if you took all the blood from Abel to Zechariah, prophet that they murdered Jews murdered if you took all of the blood the innocent blood that was shed think about that from Abel until Zechariah all the people murdered all the people dying in war all of the blood that was shed if you take all of that blood and the guilt associated with that blood it would not compare 
to what's about to happen when I die. When my blood is shed. But the good news is what? That blood speaks life. My prayer for us, and we're going to continue through our study in, in, in Colossians. My prayer for us is that we will have a daily encounter with the visible image of the invisible God who created all things for his glory. And the one who what died to what make a new creation. We got to have an encounter with him every day. Or otherwise our lives are drudgery. There's nothing here that's going to bring you joy. There's nothing here that's going to bring you peace. You're going to face things in your life. I face things in my life that are challenging. Why we got to stay focused on what? Him. Stay focused on Him. Or we'll lose our joy. We'll lose our peace. And I, I just, I, I know you got to go, but I want to sing one more little song for you, right? Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of this world will grow strangely dim. Of his glory and grace. If we're not doing that, we are miserable people. Amen? Well, I appreciate you being here tonight. Look forward to seeing you over the weekend. God bless you. Thank you. Hey, uh, by the way, don't forget, somebody's got to be a foster parent tonight. We got 12 watermelons, so 12 of you get a watermelon.